and I'd like to welcome to the stage Tim Chang. I'm not going to do any introduction because it wastes too much time, but he's a proven venture investor, global executive, and thought leader in the space of quantified self and behavioral social science-led design and gamification, and has many, many things he's done for this space, but no more ado, Tim Chang. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, that was a tough act to follow. Unfortunately, I don't have any cool visuals or, or demos or things like that. And um, to be honest, I'm a, I'm a bit nervous to give this talk because a lot of these ideas are things I've been still trying to wrestle down in my head for the last couple of years. And uh, it's going to go beyond the scope of typical kind of you know, tech and finance type of talk, which is the, the usual sort of speech I kind of give. Um, but let me start with a bit about my own story. Uh, I am a managing director with the Mayfield Fund. We're an early stage venture capital firm invent, uh, investing in early stage technologies based here in Silicon Valley. Um, I lead a lot of the consumer and mobile investments, and a lot of this really dates back to my interest as a kid playing computer games. I grew up uh, with the Apple II. My dad brought one home, I think it was 1980, and he brought this big box, and, and, and I said, what is that? And he said, it's a computer. And the first thing I said, I want to play games. And then he chucked me an AppleSoft II manual and said, there are no game companies. This is 1980. Go program it yourself. So that um, <laughs> led me to learn uh, BASIC, and it was a wonderful discovery. And man, I poured hundreds, of thousands of hours into every major title that came out since those early days. And the ones I liked the most were RPGs, role-playing games. Um, how many of you have played role-playing games? I imagine a fair amount. Do you remember the hours you'd spend crafting your, your character? And you'd pick all the traits you wanted to min-max, whether it was strength versus dexterity or intelligence versus uh, wisdom. Uh, you'd unlock skill trees, and you'd think about how you'd want to architect your character. And then um, I remember when I was in my 20s, kind of hit me like a flashing blind of the obvious. How come we don't architect our own lives the way we spend all that time crafting these perfect little avatars, right? So that kind of opened me up this idea of gamification, which is just life itself is a grand game. And I know that has had a lot of controversy in, a, in the term, but the way I kind of view it is that um, a game at its core is just a system. It's got objective, which is either system or user chosen. It's got a set of clear rules in, in how your behaviors move towards that objective and move a score up and down. And um, most of all, it has real-time feedback. It shows you uh, the effect on your score moving towards an objective based on each decision or action that you take in real time. Through that lens, notice I didn't say anything about having fun or, or those sorts of things. All of life is a game, whether it's how you report your taxes, how you get a date, how you get a job, all those sorts of things. And so that really kind of led me uh, on this quest of applying game-led thinking and design towards all systems. And that opened up the world of quantified self to me. Um, in my 20s, I, I started kind of getting more interested in fitness and nutrition. And I found that whole thing is a giant game as well. How do you max the number of grams of protein and fiber versus minimize the net grams of sugar and carbs you have? After you spend some time analyzing the data, you develop a bit of a sixth sense about everything that goes into your body. You have a running meter of the calories in versus calories out. And um, while that's been the impetus of a lot of what we've looked at in this augmented world, you know, the body hackers, the quantified self, um, I thought a lot more about sort of what comes next. And so, you know, I've been body hacking for a couple of years and trying to live this ethos of, of quantified self. I helped to co-found and uh, fund a company called Basis, which was one of the more advanced wearables. They had a pulse oximetry, which got your heart rate 24-7. It did galvanic skin response, full motion, all those sorts of things. Intel recently acquired them uh, for a pretty good number. Um, but that was just the very start. And it didn't even achieve 10% of what we wanted to go out and be able to do in terms of shaping lives. Um, but uh, in this notion of augmented world, it's, it's all about sensors everywhere, right? Adding displays to things, adding interactive interfaces, adding data visualization uh, techniques uh, to all of these, and of course, cloud connectivity everywhere. So we ask a lot about what gets augmented. We talk about a lot about how things will get augmented, how much money you'll make from augmenting these things when it all gets augmented. But lately, I've been really haunted by the question of why. Why are we doing all this augmentation? To what end? And, and what is it that drives us to, to do this? So I kind of see it as a three-step process. Um, I was a PhD dropout in control systems engineering, which is a subdiscipline of electrical engineering, kind of combined with mechanical engineering. And the one tenet there in control systems theory is you can only control that which you observe. 
So think about that a little bit. There's basically three steps. You gotta read it, observe it, T two, comprehend it, and then three, write or shape that behavior. So I think we've been on this step one of this quantify part, which is to read. That's what this whole war of sensors is about, getting sensors everywhere such that you can observe, measure, and track. That's the first step of reading things. Um, along that path, I think we're in this three-phase step that the first thing we do is try to measure our bodies. That's been the whole quantified self part, which is about you know steps or activity. Um, Interestingly, it lines up with sort of how we're building awareness of this over the decades as well. If the 70s and 80s introduced the notion of physical fitness industry, I'd say the 90s and the aughts are now turning us on to mental fitness, like companies uh, like Lumosity, which I had invested in previously, are making brain fitness a more mainstream category. Uh, what I'm really thinking about next is sort of emotional or spiritual fitness, if you will, and that'll be a whole other area. And you've probably seen the grassroots rise in this as well. How many of you have been thinking about taking on meditation or mindfulness, or even seeing such concepts, even approaching the workplace. Google is instituting mindfulness as a practice throughout the corporate culture. This to me says that this is the dawn of that new age of, of awareness and, and sort of this wellness aspect or fitness of even of what's inside, right? So in terms of the reading and measurement of this, we definitely know how to measure the body. We've got our Fitbits, our jaw bones, our bases. Um, we'll have more and more sensors that will get heart rate, and we'll have blood pressure, all those things next. Um, we're starting to figure out how to read our minds. Facebook is a giant social graph and interest graph network that's measuring all the things you spend time on, your behaviors, your interests, your habits. That is getting mapped out. Next, we're going to probably figure out how we read and measure sort of the spirit or the soul, if you will. That is through things like mindfulness, meditation. How do you measure and get feedback on focus, relaxation, emotional states? Could it be tied to your cortisol levels, levels of oxytocin being produced, et cetera? Um, this second step uh, that we're entering now away right from the read into understand and comprehend the awareness part. This part is what fascinates me right now um, because uh, really what I think all these sensors do, all the data does, it adds a lot of validity to a lot of ancient wisdom people have known for a long time. I think the reason mindfulness and meditation is so interesting now is it's moving out of the foo-foo world of sort of you know hippie or, or sort of religious connotations because when you can put a, bra uh, a sensor on your brain and show that your alpha waves are actually aligning as you do a square wave breathing exercise, that adds tangible feedback, a score, to this game of relaxation. And instead of having this sort of nebulous thing, which is, uh, I don't know, that sounds like some sort of shamanistic thing people would do. It is something that's tangible that you can do after five minutes realize, oh my gosh, mindfulness might actually work. And there's some data to show to that. So these sensors, this data that provides that instant gratification, the numbers, the hard science that we need to see to prove these sorts of things to ourselves. Otherwise, the feedback loops of practicing meditation for years, you might not know if you're doing anything right. Similarly, you can go to a gym for months. You won't see a six-pack you know, kind of shape up, but through little tracking apps that gives you a right on, keep going at it, gives you that little bit of snack size feedback that keeps you going at it. So all this is about behavior shaping, behavior change. And that takes us to the third wave, which is really we got read, we've got comprehend, and then it's about writing. So after sensors, we're gonna have more actuators coming into uh, all these different types of devices, networks, wearables, et cetera. This is the, the part that closes the loop helps us to control, change the states, and change our behaviors. That's where we get to really interesting stuff. Um, something uh, I think a little bit about, we spoke on this at uh, South by Southwest with Daniel Kraft. It was a, a topic called uh, Building the Post-Human Brain. And uh, Daniel talked about this notion of prosthetics for your brain. Sounds kind of crazy, but we're already there. What is Dropbox for? What is Instagram except outsourcing your entire visual memory, right? Um, I think we're pretty soon gonna get to the point that there are prosthetics for body, mind, and soul. Um, how many of you saw the movie Her? I thought that was pretty fantastic, and that actually opened up a whole lot of interesting ideas for me on the notion of what I term machine empathy, which um, is, is a very simple idea. Uh, isn't it odd that most applications and computer systems only have one tone of voice to talk to you in? Do you remember Microsoft Clippy? How many of you got pissed off at that thing and totally uninstalled it? <laughs> and you know why? It's because of the emotional state dissonance that it had. Clippy was unceasingly cheerful, 
And the thing about human beings is, if you're getting pissed off and something is continuing to be more and more cheerful at you, it actually makes you more pissed off, right? <laughs> It's really, really annoying when things don't tune their emotional state to you. And that's what machines and applications have not done until now. But within this next year or two, I think we're going to see more and more technologies that introduce this idea of sort of machine empathy or an understanding of the user's emotional state. Um, I've been looking for entrepreneurs to, to go explore this area, but uh, well, here's a simple idea. Let's say I OAuth all of my emails, my text messages, all of my social media updates um, into a semantic analysis engine. Run a quick analysis. You probably know my tone of voice. You'd know um, the top 100 phrases I use all the time. Uh, pretty soon, you probably could write my emails for me. And you'd see the same two dozen types of emails I write week in, week out. Hey, let's grab coffee. Hey, let's catch up. Hey, what are you doing, et cetera, et cetera, right? So within that, you'd build a giant state machine of exactly sort of my habits, my state, my tone of voice. You could probably tell roughly my emotional state, right? Um, with a few simple heuristics, you could look at my calendar and see, oh, I've, you've got five back-to-back -back meetings. By meeting four, you're probably 15 minutes behind and probably pretty frazzled. If I'm Google Now and just give you a generic alert saying, you are 15 minutes behind, I'm going to say, F you, Google Now, I already know that, right? <laughs> Instead, if you phrase it a little bit differently, say, hey, I noticed you're probably 15 minutes behind and pretty frazzled. Shall I ask Joe to reschedule for another day? That's what your admin would do for you, right? It's just a little bit of that empathy. And I think that's something that we're going to see uh, with machine intelligence and, and all these applications coming in. The point of all that is that I think the technology, all these sensors, all of the augmentation, it's really just a tool and ultimately a mirror to help us understand ourselves as humans. And what I really hope is that it helps us make us more human, better humans. There's this tension I sense in Silicon Valley right now where we're using technology in two different directions. One is to automate things to the point where we minimize human contact. I want to press a button and I want everything done for me and I do not want to interface with other human beings. The other direction, though, is to use technology to perhaps make us more in tune with ourselves and have more authentic connections, right? To actually be able to understand each other better. That's the promise of apps like Secret and Whisper and things like that. But what I kind of fear is that social media 1.0 and connectivity, it sort of led to sort of this um, fake behavior. Because let's face it. You're not really your authentic self on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. You're engineering the aspirational branded self you want everybody to see you as. What is the game of social media? It's collecting the most number of likes, tweets, and retweets. The only failed Facebook status update is one that gets no likes or comments, right? So the thing is, though, can technology be used as something to really show us ourselves and the full range of all the possibilities we can be? I call this sort of the possibility space of all of the possible yous. Every you that you could be in the future, there could be a, a, a really ripped buff you, there could be a PhD version of you, there could be a drug addict, completely destitute version of you. They are all within that realm of that possibility space. Um, there is a uh, wonderful story, I don't know if any of you have read, it's uh, by Louis Borges, it's called The Library of Babel. And the, the, the premise of it goes like this. Imagine a library that's infinite, and within every book, on every page, there is, a, there is a line of text that follows the same format. It is basically every possible permutation of all letters from A, 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 B, A, C, on and on and on and down. And through this library, every possible permutation of all letters and words, stories are formed. It's very similar to when I was a kid, I, was, I, was, I once uh, was told, if a million monkeys sat at a million typewriters and typed for a million years, they'd eventually produce the works of Shakespeare. What I didn't realize is those monkeys would also, through the course of time, produce every possible work, period, every story out there. Um, what does this have to do with anything? Well, I visited this company called Cambrian Genomics the other day up in San Francisco. Up there in Soma, they've got the equivalent of the maker bot of DNA. They're printing out from raw organic materials basically little DNA sequences, all the A's, the C's, the T's, the G's, all billions of these base pairs. And uh, well, some of the first applications sound kind of silly. They figured out the DNA part uh, for a firefly that, that glows, mixed it with plants and have glowing house plants. And they're sold as party gifts and novelties. And they sold a couple million of these things. Um, pretty soon we'll probably see glowing marijuana plants and fun things like that. Um, 
Their second application, they uh, were able to extract the smell and the color of cherries and bananas, which are pretty well-known uh, DNA chains. And um, they are able to mix them into you know, E. coli and other types of organisms such that you could feed it to your pet and your pet would produce uh, really pleasant smelling and colored excrement. Sounds kind of silly, but this is just the start. You can print any chain. So what are some of the customer applications doing? Um, there is a uh, polo horse breeder in Argentina mapping out all sorts of mutations on a sort of programmatic basis, going to take those, print them out, order from Cambridge Genomics, use IVF, and go create lots of attempts at mutant super polo horses, right? So what struck me when I visit Cambrian Genomics is, man, if I were them, I want to create DNApedia. I want to create the Library of Babel and every possible chain of ACs, Ts, and Gs and own and know what those properties are. My friend uh, uh, Rob Reed, uh, an author and uh, TED speaker, he said, Tim, that's impossible. That'll take more matter than is all in the universe to do. Um, and then it kind of struck me, uh, perhaps that's what the universe is, is a giant Monte Carlo experiment running every possible permutation of all these sorts of things in all configurations. Um, and that there's many universes running this experiment over and over and over again. So tying this back, I know this is a little way out there, but tying it back to technology and, and the purpose of all this, um, until now, all of our lives have been a, a monkey's typewriter page banging out a different story, a different experiment. And without technology, those stories are often lost. They are maybe you know, captured in a two-sentence eulogy, or it's a, a legend that's passed down through the ages, like a uh, you know, kind of human game of telephone. But what I think is interesting about technology is that the cost of measuring, storing, capturing, analyzing, and then basically communicating and sharing and connecting these stories is coming to the point that it is um, basically costless to capture that story of your life every moment, your time, not just your timeline, not just your highlights, but every second, every image, every thought you have, every communication. Within this giant database, as that's connected, you can start to see the patterns emerge across the stories of all our lives, and you might even see templates that, wow, there are maybe only a hundred types of stories, and there are all these permutations thereof. And um, that, I think, is what a lot of these sensors will, will get to do. But really, the next step is that as the actuators kick in, as we are able to hack our wetware, as we understand our neuroelectrical interfaces of our bodies, I think our fate is to really transcend our physical form and really go beyond that and um, you know, kind of figure out uh, what it is uh, that we want to become if all states are possible. Again, this is sounding really, really out there, but um, I was in Korea for a conference two weeks ago, and uh, in Seoul, they have nailed the plastic surgery business down to an absolute science. It's like Starbucks, and it's flawless. They can, they, can, they can break down your cheekbones, reconstruct your jawline, everything. They can give you anime eyes, really large and beautiful. Um, the irony, though, is that there tends to be you know, just two or three templates that are really popular, so all the women look alike. And they're all gorgeous. And it's led to some pretty crazy things where men will sometimes sue their wives when their children are born because you get these really fugly babies and you're like, <laughs> but. <laughs> the natural answer to that is actually, that's okay, just wait till the kid's old enough for plastic surgery. Um, this brings up a really interesting question. What is beauty and is a manufactured beauty through such a seamless, um, plastic surgery process any less beautiful than that which is natural? Isn't that blurring the line between your physical state and an avatar you would choose and painstakingly craft in Second Life or um, any other virtual world, just like those RPGs when we grew up, right? So that's what I mean, that this age is already here where you can choose that state which you want to be. And um, I think that part gets pretty interesting because as technology opens up the scenarios we can unlock for ourselves, then the real question is the intent you bring to it and the story you want to write with it. If all states are possible, if you could look any way you wanted to, then all that matters is the choice that you would make, the intention and the why, right? And how that might influence others. Those are the things that, that really interest me in, in terms of how we're moving from sort of the, the read part of the augmented world to the write part. Um, I think next up, I think our memories are gonna be up for grabs as well. Um, neuroscience shows that memories are not like a hard drive. Your memories are not encoded and stored perfectly like digital bits into silicon. Um, 
Instead, they are shaped by the emotions they're encoded with, and every time you go and access that memory, pull it back out and examine it, and put it back, it's actually re-encoded in a different way. It's kind of why, um, well, if you were to look back on, on Star Wars and how you remember it when you saw it as a kid versus if you were to pull it now and watch it, it'd actually be a little bit different. You'd kind of say, hmm, it wasn't nearly as cool as I thought it was when I was a kid. Um, it's also when you uh, start to relay and retell memories, they change over time, like playing telephone with yourself. Well, it turns out these can be hackable as well. Emotions really shape a lot of how these memories are burned in. And um, with things like Oculus Rift, you can re-simulate um, basically consciousness and re-encode them. So, uh, you know, the military is doing experiments now with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder where you can simulate that traumatic experience like driving over the IED that blew off your legs. But at this time, instead of all the painful memories that were burned into that experience, imagine using things like MDMA and re-encoding it and stripping out the negative emotions so it, that you can get the memory back to a closer to a neutral emotional state. Um, another wonderful experiment I've seen is a digital artist using um, VR headsets to give uh, sort of regular people a full-on experience of what it's like to have absolute paranoid schizophrenia. These are tools which actually, to me, generate empathy, back to that notion of technology as a mirror and a tool to really connect ourselves. Um, something I think a lot about is that the, the pursuit of all art, the pursuit of almost anything really in all our lives is just to capture and explain, this is how I feel, this is what it feels like to be me. And if I could just explain that to one other person, then I'll have assurance that this thing, this reality, this system is on, right? But every medium we choose, words, music, paint, all these things, they're, they're, they're imperfect. Therein lies the beauty that you, know, you capture these, these emotions and you try to transmit them and other people take the meaning from it. But what I think the holy grail is, is can these technologies be used as an engine for perfect empathy? I don't want you to tell me what it's like to be you. I want to know exactly what it feels like to be you in your reality, in your state. And I think that's really the, the ultimate goal of where this is going and, and what I think a tech-enabled soul could be. Because what I think ultimately what it's all about, the technology within 100 years, if we don't run out of resources and blow ourselves up, will allow us to arbitrarily take on all sorts of physical and digital forms. Um, the analogy I have is, uh, imagine that you're a bird that has discovered the power of your wings, and you realize you can fly anywhere, at any speed, do anything. The only question is, where do you want to fly? What path do you want to take in the canvas in that sky? So similarly, as technology opens up the tools to do all these things, all that's left is, what is the story that you want to write? And as it gets captured, it's shared with others and that it's connected with all these others. Eventually, I think the point of all this stuff is that that soul, our soul, is that story. As they get interconnected, we become that networked consciousness that everybody kind of talks about, right? And uh, we will become this sort of more global, uh, interconnected sort of species. Uh, my own theories are that at that point we'll be welcome to the club and there'll be lots of other species that are way transcended that are already and said, finally, welcome to the club. And then we'll all link up and do that at a galactic interspecies scale and then um, on and on and on it goes. But the, to me, this, this unlocks a puzzle for me I've, I've thought a lot about is um, all of the tensions that we experience in, in things, whether it's you know right down to, are we a particle, are we a wave? Um, property rights versus open source. Um, you know, gated estate versus a tribal community. The ego versus the collective. This convergence, divergence, this pattern is, is basically the machinery of the universe grinding against itself. And the technology allows us to actually be self-aware of the grinding of those states and actually have a, a hand in shaping it. This is kind of fun, it's a big deal. We are the first species on this planet that is actually self-aware of our evolution path and now has the tools to shape it. And that's the really cool part. Um, this stuff I know is really, really kind of abstract, but uh, in essence, that is a lot of what I've been trying to invest in these days. And I'm, I'm very excited for all the entrepreneurs in this room working on hacking these things together. These are all just hacks, connecting systems, sensors, showing the feedback, figuring out how to let us then shape uh, our, our lives with that data. But um, I do hope that uh, you'll stop every once in a while, and as we hook all these things up, kind of step back and think, why? Why are we connecting it? Where are we going with it? And how does that uh, really help shape you know, uh, the story of yourself and for others? Thank you.
Kapoom, right? Awesome. Thanks very much. One more round of applause for Tim Chang.